So I will speak a little bit of my work towards this restaurant soundscape simulator. And to recall my PhD work from the work of how we perceive pristine nature and to the uh, very designed environments in, in art installations, I, I see it as being in the middle, we have the service scapes. So there's something about non-designed, semi-designed and designed environments. There's kind of an axis of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, designability or intentionality that somehow uh, exists in these environments. And then more, even more speculative, another orthogonal axis here where we have um, unimodal or multimodal environments. But the service scape environments, I find them very interesting because indeed they are very, um, they're very designed and they're also very multimodal. So in Schaefer's, Schaefer's soundscape concept and also in the, in the uh, ISO definition of 2014 that several other people referred to, the um, soundscape is construed as a psychological um, phenomenon, really, that originates in actual physical sound sources that are distributed in space and time. So there is this psychophysical uh, collision here that we try to work with. From the Cresson people in, in uh, Grenoble to Sweden via Bjorn Hellström and his work, we have these very useful concepts of ubiquity and metabol that refer to what, how soundscapes can be perceived, or rather how they are, um, how is it difficult to disentangle the sound sources within the soundscape. So ubiquity refers to um, a, a spatial uh, difficulty of understanding sound sources and metabol about their uh, temporal uh, resolution. Of course, Schaeffer, he introduced several ways of thinking about the uh, sound sources as events. And he referred to them, I think, mainly in two different ways. And one was from the referential aspects, so sound as sources, where we can identify, we can pinpoint the source that I hear. It actually originates in a physical object that I can see, I can touch, I can conceive of. The other thing, the other um, classification strategy, if you want, that Schaefer talked about had to do with significance or purpose. And this is where his ideas of sound or sound events as being keynotes or signals or sound marks, that's where it comes in. And of course, this somehow plays into our ability really to, um, uh, to perform stream uh, stream segregation and, and analysis of this continuous information through our senses and to um, separate these, the stream into events that then, through our learning of language, learning of the environment, we understand as being separated events. So the Cresson, Thibault uh, people, uh, they, they introduced this con concept of synecdoche, which is an isolated event within the whole. Now, I think this, these concepts here, I, I, I find them useful when thinking about uh, how perception and can inform design. And I've tried to apply this in understanding better how restaurant environments, specifically soundscapes in restaurants, how they may or may not work. So I started, or one, after a while I should say, I, I, I was able to do this uh, fairly large survey of eating environment, eating places in uh, Singapore. And uh, um, I and a, a good couple of assistants, uh, we collected data, psycho psychoacoustic data, so on-site measurement of, um, um, of uh, uh, sound pressure level, and uh, recordings as well, so simultaneously. Physical, so that's a 
basically what we can understand from the environment just by observing this, I will come back to this, um, it has to do with size um, and interior materials in particular and occupancy, how many people are in these environments. The perceptual features uh, refer to how do we evaluate this, what, what does the environment do to me as an observer or listener in this environment. And, and for that last part, I, I very much uh, rely on the work in, with the Stockholm group of people, with Mats Nilsson and Östen Axelsson, that I mentioned earlier, with the uh, Swedish Soundscape Quality Protocol. Um, so we went to uh, 112 restaurants. We also did photography, so there's part of this, not part of this article, but it's part of it that enabled other research where we could do sort of matching between uh, recorded soundscapes and, and photography as well. So are people able to, to uh, somehow recognize um, photography uh, and soundscape? And yes, they are. Uh, many things in this article, I just point out two or three. The, this sl correlation slope where you have the, um, um, what do you have here? Where you have mean ratings of, uh, uh, of, of quality here, so you have low quality and high quality. So when you have a lot of people, people think that we have low quality environments. So I think somewhere people, when they go to restaurants, they don't quite like other people in there. So keep that in mind as well. So in this. Um, this looks like you, know, you, you take a, like a hail gun and you shoot a target this morning. But this is a picture of the 100, 112 um, uh, restaurants, but separated into uh, environments by design style. So that's the bar buffet, cafe, fast food, hawker, and dining. And also food style. So there's Chinese menu, there's a mixed fusion me menu. Other Asian, that might be Japanese or, or Indian or Korean, and of course the Western one. So, one, after being able to categorize um, these 112 places, could then compare or correlate uh, the uh, uh, perceptual, um, perceptual evaluations of them and to find out that indeed quality here on this axis. It depends on, on sound level, but not as much as you may first, first imagine, even though there is, a, of course, a regression that goes through this way. But it also, the, the perception of quality also depends on the design style of the environments and things like priciness of comparable me menu items, and that's the size of these uh, uh, icons here. But through this study, I got interested in, in um, interior design. So this is not at all where I come from. I'm a total amateur. But here, since I had the over lunch, I was discussing with some of the architects here. So I will volunteer some uh, ideas from the outside, as it were. So <clears throat> to imagine where, where are these sound sources? Are they technological, human, or natural, as in their uh, uh, referential aspects? Are they designed or non-designed? Do we, do we know that they are inside the enclosure, the environment, or do we know that they are from the outside? So this, this advanced as, as some, um, some kind of um, um, typology, really, of sound sources in restaurants. But I, I felt that it wasn't, it wasn't enough and I couldn't use it directly then uh, to pursue work. So I had to go to the next step um, and go away from Schaeferian typology and try to work bottom up with a taxonomic approach instead. So basically I went out to uh, another round of restaurants, 40 restaurants, and asking 10 people at each restaurant and just asking them what sounds do you hear around you? And what sounds do you find characteristic for the environment that you're in at this point? And do you like them or do you not like them? So this concept of liking, or which is associated with preference, which is associated with, with pleasantness, eventually. But the really simplest 
a question I think that you can ask people is, do you like or do you not like? Or as we say in Singapore English, like or not? <laughs> well, that's Singlish for you. <clears throat> so from, from, that, from that data, so bottom-up data, um, I, I um, constructed the taxonomy. So you see in the middle there, there's uh, about more than a thousand original annotations reduced uh, into a couple of hundreds, analyzed by sound and source in order to uh, f uh, find uh, a, a baseline, if you want, of, of, of this taxonomy of what I call sound sources that has 34 units. I think the next, uh, I'll jump a little bit because it comes here. This is a, a, an overview of this taxonomy where you have um, the many and then a reduction, reduction in complexity while trying to maintain stepwise the, the way that these units represent the whole. And that was the important question. Uh, well, here's part of that. And well, this is the liking aspect. So you have, this can be fun to see what kind of sounds do people really not like? Well, I think Juan talked about the footfalls or steps and people walking, screeching chairs are really not liked. And we also have quite low on in the negative, a bit, well, in the middle, you see talking people and people. So as seen in other restaurant in, uh, uh, research investigating uh, restaurant soundscapes, um, one of the main sources of discontent is really the voices of other people. So I thought it was interesting. And it's also something that other um, instruments or other studies have, I think, not really explored uh, enough, is um, the finer nuances of how we, in that kind of public environment, how we relate to other people. So, for example, Min Ho and uh, Rostengen Bush, or even Axelsson in his work, are, have quite global categories, while uh, at the level three of, the, of this present work, we can distinguish between the eating sounds of people, the blurred crowd sounds, and the conversation sounds. And the blurred uh, crowd sounds are heard as very unliked or negative, and conversation sounds, such as laughter, and even if you include shouting, for example, it still comes up as being definitely positive. So I have a study currently running now in one restaurant. So that would be a case study, it's running over a longer time, and, uh, and I also intend to make um, um, measurements of things like uh, reverberation time and interviews with the people working in the restaurant and so forth. But the main purpose here is to uh, do yet another uh, validation of the taxonomy, particularly looking at um, do we need to have an instrument that has a fine gradation of uh, different kinds of sound sources, or can we get by with having one where these <coughs> sound sources are, are lumped together and put into categories? How much can we still capture a, uh, to have a significant representativity of the whole? Simulation is a way of doing analysis by synthesis. So I, got, I got this from Yuan Sundberg, that many of you know, the voice people for sure. So I, I'm just going to blast through a couple of ideas here that relate to, the, uh, to working with creating a, a simulator. Well, from Wale in in, uh, he's, he's writing about the importance of, of uh, letting the, the user of a simulator be able to sort of explore different parts of this as an environment and to, to give, it up, give it to the user to be very active. And I think that's a, an important um, um, thing with a good simulator. What we can learn from Thorogood is, well, he relies on, on about Truex. Uh, listener recognize, recognizability of the sound source material to maintain that, so that's basically rather use recordings and, and do not synthesize the sounds as much. You need to somehow work with real things. And their work is interesting. 
um, because they, uh, they they bring in the uh, the emotional, the affect uh, perspective here as well in their uh, user interface that you see a picture from. And the third uh, method, if you want, is to to employ some like machine learning. Um, a call T and his uh, Italian team, they uh, they. Uh, they, they have a method, so it's, it's a quite technical method, but it has to do with how you optimize uh, among a, a large number of, of candidate uh, sources to use in a simulation. You can, you can find the optimal one by, by using uh, a cost function that minimizes the difference between your candidates and the target sound frame. And then they also have strategies for, for working with uh, realistic temporal distribution of sound events. Uh, Bottle Doran has also done this. So this is sort of the stage of my, my prototype in working now. Um, what I can do here is to is to work with the concept of of the uh, uh, different levels of the taxonomy, four levels at this point, and sort of load the uh, units inside. So for level two here, there's 13 different uh, categories that you see. So I can select, well, now it's already selected, blurred crowd sounds. The, it will call up uh, files that, are, of course, so here I, in this version, there's uh, something like uh, uh, close to 600, 560 sounds. And they have been uh, gathered from uh, from freesound.org using the uh, uh, annotations uh, in 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 there. And uh, I what I want to do I, I know there's an SDK for for how you can do automatic retrieval of uh, of sounds from freesound.org. And of course, it would be great to automatize this, right? You just type in keywords and you get 2,000 sound files onto your computer, and it's entirely possible. Uh, so that will be one step further with this system. Um, not quite there yet, so I pick pick items within the different categories that match the semantics, so the annotations. And uh, what is, yes, I do uh, some, some basic um, modeling of the, um, uh, of the uh, things like this, so this, this is a Gaussian distribution of, uh, you see here, so uh, a new sound that's being called in, it will not always be played back at the, at the level, the amplitude, but rather um, a Gaussian distribution around a typical value. And same thing for the distance perspective. So here, there's always listener in the centrum, center, and, and a quadraphonic um, specialization here, but there's a concept of typical distance that we can work with. Uh, and what is the third thing I want to say? Yes, quite importantly, we need to model, um, we need to model when to trigger new sounds within a category. Um, um, so what uh, Crusoe and, and uh, Hellström said about ubiquity and metabol has to do with sort of the consistency, the stability of these environments. And I, I think that can work for, um, environments such as restaurants, that uh, they have predictable static qualities. So that is also, yes, this is where I, I model this now um, with a curve that looks like this. Oh, I just sort of fake a little bit here. This is a, um, <laughs> a sort of a, a double uh, logistic, uh, lo logistic curve where there's a flat part here, which represents the um, sustainability rate. So at, there's, a, there's a rate of triggering new files within this category that would make it keep on forever. But if we have uh, too few of them, and we'll be on the left side of this graph, and we have a higher probability of triggering sounds in that category. By contrast, if we have um, too, too many or more playing that we would want, then we'd be on the lower part here, the right part. So this this is really a very much a prototype system. 
the, in the implementation and trying to make this work and sort of keep track of what what are the global parameters that we will want to work with. Of course, I, I will want to use this in in a, in a user uh, user experience study eventually, and also compare it with actual recordings of of, uh, of restaurant soundscapes. But that is future work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Per Magnus. Uh, this was uh, really hardcore programming. No, uh, <laughs>